Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hello there. Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast. I am your host, Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to earn more in less time doing work they love for better clients. You can find detailed show notes to this episode at b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 139. And those notes include a summary of our discussion as well as links to resources and downloads mentioned during the show. So today we're talking health insurance for freelancers. And more specifically, we're exploring two unconventional options to traditional health insurance. And I have to tell you, I can't remember the last time in 139 episodes, almost five years of doing this show, that I heard from so many listeners telling me how much they're looking forward to this particular episode. I put the topic out on Facebook with a couple of basic questions. Uh, I basically asked, hey, do you want to hear more about this? And if so, what questions would you have in terms of about getting health insurance? And the feedback that you gave me was extremely helpful. I got tons of comments. Uh, Some discussions just kind of took a life on their own uh, in in that uh, thread. And I got several dozen emails. Even people at conferences have been stopping me, just telling me, hey, I... I saw that you're doing, you know, the show. I can't wait to to listen to it. So uh, I'm glad I struck a nerve. Obviously, this is uh, this is a top of mind issue, especially right now with so much up in the air and so many questions unanswered. Now I'm going to do a bit of a longer introduction for the show because there's some things I want to make sure I cover, and I want to set the the stage for a positive discussion here. Um, the first thing I should mention is I don't want to give you the same information everyone else is giving you on this topic. You know, the questions that I, I got a lot of people asking me, where can I get affordable health insurance? And I think that's the wrong question to ask right now. And no offense if you're asking that question, but I think the better question to ask is, what are my options? Because where can I get affordable health insurance limits your search, limits your thinking to one specific approach. And unfortunately, most of the options there for many of us are just either not affordable or just not really a a good option. When you ask, what are my options? You just opened up the possibilities. Okay. I don't know about you, but I don't want the same garbage from a different source. That to me is not a real solution. I'm also not looking to save $50 a month, okay? When I'm up to $1,400 a month in premiums, a $25 to $50 a month savings is not really helping me out, especially consider the pain of making a transition from a plan that I've had for 11 years that continues to go up by 20, 25% a year. Today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on two options that most people don't even know exist. Okay. And this is the result of asking that question. What are my options? You know, what else am I not looking at? Are there options out there that I may not be considering because I don't even know exists? The first option we're going to be talking about is health indemnity plans. And the second one is medical cost sharing. Now, a few points before we get started, and, and please, again, bear with me. Number one, if you're outside the U.S., there's no need to listen to this episode. Just go ahead and hit pause, move on to the next one, listen to some of our archives. There's a lot of great stuff in there, and I apologize, but this is a hot topic for my U.S. audience, so I want to make sure I address it. Number two, these options that I'm going to uh, highlight today are not for everyone. Okay, I'm not trying to please everybody. I'm trying to please those of us who are in a situation where we really need to get creative about a solution and we need to take matters into our own hands. Number three, I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not an insurance professional. I don't even play those things on the internet. Okay, So you need to do your own due diligence. You need to investigate these and other options on your own. And in that process, I recommend consulting with your financial professional before making any decision related to your health insurance. Number four, you need to understand that there's no perfect solution out there. I've reached that conclusion finally this year. Our healthcare system in this country is broken. 
Okay, there's no point in sugarcoating that. And, and let me just, if you will allow me a minute of editorial, we can do so much better. You know, politicians are so focused on fighting the battle of who will pay for this mess that we're not even addressing some of the other critical issues, such as the cost side of the problem. I really believe that's where a huge part of the problem lies, and there are immense opportunities out there, and I'm extremely disappointed that, that we're not even having that discussion. As a country, we need the will to solve this complex problem, and we need to hold our politicians accountable. If they choose to serve lobbyists, if they choose to pander to special interests, they need to know that we're watching and they're on the hook, and we need to make sure to act and to vote. Number five, it's not just the politician's fault. Okay, as much as I like to beat up on them because they do need to get beat up on. We all need to take ownership in this area. You know, let's face it, most of us could get healthier by making different lifestyle choices. And we need to start treating and thinking about health insurance as a consumer who's truly vested in the process and not just someone else's problem. In other words, we need to be smarter healthcare consumers. We need to shop around. I mean, when was the last time I've had health insurance my entire adult life? I've been fortunate enough. I've, I've had coverage and for many, many years. I just thought, well, that's the, that's the insurance company's problem. You know, okay, fine. Just bill them. I don't know how much it is, you know, in the unfortunate part of that is that it breeds a different type of consumer. It breeds this attitude of, well, it's not my money. You know, it's somebody else's money. It's the insurance company. It's, it's not me. And, and that's unfortunate because when you think about everything else in life, even big purchases, it's our money and we're better consumers. We get better services and better products when we have skin in the game. So we need to shop around, we need to do a research, and we need to make wise choices. And much of that starts happening when we have greater control and will we share into the solution. And I'll give you a quick example of that. So my son needs to have oral surgery. And it's pretty extensive. I uh, won't get into the details, but I'll just say that our dentist said, okay, well, I really trust this surgeon um, across the street. Go go to them. You really need to get this done in the next few months. Um, my wife took him there. They uh, they quoted us $2,700. Now, it, it sounded high to me, okay, because that is the cash price. I mean, the, the, the insurance will not cover it, okay, which is, you know, another issue. Um but it's, it's medically necessary, but the insurance company won't cover it. it, I, it I went ahead and, and started doing some research. And in my basic research, I realized that this is on the higher side for the procedures he needs to get done. So how did I know that? Well, I called the surgeon and I talked to the business office and I, I asked them to give me the medical codes for what he needs done. With those codes, I was able to do some research online. And I realized that this is on the very high end of the national average. So in, in our area, I went to Google Maps and found some other oral surgeons within just a few miles of us. I called the one that sounded the most reputable and uh, was also close. And I gave them the medical codes. I explained the situation and said, well, we would still need to see them. We need to see your son. However, um, it would be no more than $1,700. Okay. So just in, in the 10, 15 minutes of research, I was able to essentially save a thousand dollars, you know, when I'm the one who's in the hook, when I have to pay for some of it, when I have to pay for most or all of it, we become better consumers. Now, I, I want to be sensitive to folks who have pre existing conditions and other situations that are beyond challenging. Okay. I'm not trying to throw out a blanket statement that, you know, this is every, we all need to do this. Uh, I'm not talking about that. Those are difficult circumstances that require different approaches, different solutions. I'm just talking about general everyday stuff that when there's no ownership, I, I think that that's when you start seeing prices escalate. And there are other factors. I understand that. Now, that leads me to my sixth point. Don't send me hate mail because you don't like these options I'm presenting. Um, I, I, I've even turned off the comments uh, for this in, in my other pages. Don't send me emails or private messages asking me questions about these options, about other options. Again, 
I'm not a financial insurance professional. I'm merely exposing some options for you to consider. Now, in the interest of full transparency, I recently canceled my major medical health insurance policy with United Healthcare, and I signed up for an indemnity health plan from New Era Life, and that's the first option that we're going to talk about. And that's how I met my first guest, Mark Dunn. Um, then what I did, just so you know what, what I'm doing, I'm not saying this is what you should do. I signed up with a Christian cost sharing ministry as a backup. And that's the second option we're going to be talking about. I won't get into the details, but in doing all my research, I found that this is going to be the best option for me and my family. And even, even though I have both of those now, my total monthly costs dropped by almost 50%. You know, I just cannot continue to justify premiums that are rising at over 20% per year and have tripled since I first got the policy. Okay, I, I don't mind paying for health insurance. I want to get health insurance, but there comes a point when you know enough is enough. Number eight, I do not profit in any way by telling you about these options. I'm not affiliated with any of these companies or I have no kind of personal or financial interest in any of them. I'm just presenting you with some options that I think most people need to, to know about because I sure didn't know about them until recently. And then finally, um, I've included a very simple resource guide on the show notes page that I encourage you to download. It will make your research a little bit easier. You can find that, again, b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 139. All right, so with that, my first guest, his name is Mark Dunn. He's president of America's Benefit LLC. It's a health insurance brokerage. And I met Mark recently through my accountant. My CPA uh, suggested that I take a look at this particular option and contact Mark to see if he might be able to help me. Um, I basically approached him saying, look, this is unsustainable. Are there any other options? Do you recommend any other options? And I had a couple other questions and he recommended that I talk to Mike. So that's how we connected Mark is going to talk about health indemnity plans. Again, he's going to throw a lot of information your way, a couple of resources he's pointing you to. Make sure to do your due diligence, do your research, but hopefully this will get you thinking about a different potential option you might be able to take advantage of. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks, Ed. I appreciate you having me on board today. Well, this is a hot, hot topic, and it's becoming... Uh, even more top of mind for uh, for folks, especially self-employed professionals who are looking for options. So I'm very excited to be talking with you about that. And uh, I want to kind of dive right in. But before we do that, I think it's important for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, the, the, the company that you're with, what you guys do, and maybe a little bit of history there in terms of um, you know how you guys came about. Okay. Well, I've, I've been in the insurance industry since the late 80s. I'm a certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant, worked on risk management for most of my clients. Um, I've, I've ran into New Era Life a couple of years ago when I was searching for things that we could do because my health insurance premiums were going out of, out of, out of whack. They're getting too high even then. Uh, I ran across New Era Life. Uh, what is unique about those guys is uh, Dr. Bill Chen. He's the person who bought them out in 1999, took a company that was almost defunct, uh, now it's a billion dollar insurance company. It's been steadily upgraded year after year. It's now at B plus uh, plus, which is just one little notch between uh, A. He actually he's one of the world's top statisticians, and he'll he'll be the first one to tell you if you look at his stats, it's better than most of the A companies. But since he's still growing, uh, he's having a harder time getting the A. But he thinks he'll be getting it any time. Uh, what he focuses on, and, and what his big thing is, he's trying to help change healthcare the way we have it today. He says it's pretty it, it's pretty sad when you when you take somebody who's 67 years old, they go in for shoulder surgery, he says, and they look down the Medicare list and say, okay, that should have been 6,500 bucks. They take 6,500 bucks, they go on their, their own way, but two weeks later, you come in age 50, same shoulder surgery, same physician, they do the same surgery, look down the list and say 6,500, charge them 25,000. He says, doesn't make any sense. Why should they be getting 6,000 something and you're getting charged 25,000. So that's where he came in to try to help us understand healthcare cost. And once you understand the cost, you can do something about it. So that's the plans he's put together to help us get out of just giving a card down and saying, here, I can do my health insurance without regard to cost. We want people to recognize what things cost in the healthcare arena. And by doing so, we think we control costs in the future. 
So just to be clear, you represent New Era Life uh, as an insurance agent, as a financial advisor, uh, and these are the guys who are, are doing this, right? They're, they're the ones going in that yeah. direction. Yes, I have I have several other options to go along with it, but that's that's the base I start out, start out with in most cases because they, they make a great hospital and surgery program, and then we sort of add things to it, and we can sort of build the program to whatever the customer needs, whether he needs everything covered or just just wants a hospital and surgical program to make sure he's protected from the big stuff. We can do it either way for him. Well, let, let's do, you, you mentioned the cost issue and that was a great example. I actually want to, to uh, talk a little bit about that because I reached out to you uh, because my major medical policy premiums have just gotten out of control. I know I'm not any different from anybody else. They've gone up 23% each year, the last two or three years, um, and they've tripled since I got this particular policy 11 years ago when I went out on my own. So I'm curious, what's happening out there? Why are the premiums so out of control? And why is the example you just gave me not an exaggeration? That makes zero sense whatsoever. You know, what's going with the ACA is because premiums are skyrocketing, this next year will be the first year in U.S. history when health insurance premiums are higher than the average mortgage premium. So you're paying more now for your health insurance than you would for your mortgage, which doesn't make any sense at all. People can't afford to pay it, so the healthier people are paying off of health coverage is left and right. They're signing up with programs like ours, which help them reduce their cost, or they're going without coverage uh, because they just can't afford to, to keep going up in prices. So what's that leaving on the on the the pile of people which are claiming against the ACA now are getting uh, sicker and sicker because the healthier people are dropping out. They can't afford it, but the people with major illnesses have to stay there because that's what they need for coverage. So they're coming in. The healthy people are, do- are jumping off left and right to plans like art that we offer. Or there's also like there's there's some uh, Christian programs. I have I have pretty much the whole gambit of programs I can offer to people. So I sort of try to figure out what their needs are and work from that basis and sort of build the program to what they need. But, but that's what's happening in the industry. And, and every time and the premiums going up again, they're going up another 25%. People just can't afford it. So they're going to be dropping off again this year, again, which will leave sicker people in the program. And next year you can expect the same thing. Yeah. So this is a vicious cycle, uh, which is going to continue to accelerate based on what you just described. It, um, I, and I understand that there are other fundamental factors such as, you know, an aging population and, and all those things. I don't think personally we're doing enough to really control costs uh, on, on, you know, on the side of things where those could be controlled in terms of efficiencies and so forth, but um, and, and fraud and waste. But I'm curious, you know, let's go back to that example you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I paid $6,500. Somebody else, they want to charge them 25000 I mean, how is that even possible? Because that, uh, at least the way I'm seeing it, that doesn't really address what you just talked about in terms of sicker people versus healthier people. That just seems to me like, uh, I don't know, price gouging or, you know, just, just doctors and hospitals are just trying to get whatever they can. It's a big shell game that goes on. If you understand what's really going on out there, I, I represent, like, through some of our programs, you get to utilize some of these PPO programs, like we utilize PHCS. PHCS, I, then I said, well, how does PHCS get paid? So I was talking with the different people at our home office and stuff, and I found out the way they get paid is if, if they, they want the bill to be as high as, po- as high as possible, they'll go six, eight, ten times Medicare because they get paid off at the discount. So if they get a $100,000 bill, and they discount it down, and they say that well, the bill should have only been fifteen. Okay, so they reduce it to fifteen. They get paid off of that spread, the eighty-five thousand. They get a percentage of that. So the insurance company then pays fifteen thousand to the claim, and pays the PPO a percentage of the difference. So that's how the PPOs are getting paid. So the, they want the hospital to put the highest charge as possible on that bill, which doesn't make any sense. It's counterintuitive to try to reduce cost. That's actually what's going on out there. I've, I've, I've been looking at this over and over, and it just doesn't make sense. We've got a system that's broken. So that's what we try to do is try to bring that back in. We hire, we actually hire an outside advocacy agency to negotiate our, our, our hospital bills for our members so they don't get stuck with those real high bills if they're outside of a PPO program. Yeah, because it sounds like they're, that makes a lot of sense. And now I see mm-hmm. – I knew there had to be some reasoning to, to that um, – so uh, let's talk a little bit about the distinctions between major medical insurance and what new era life offers. Could, so, you know, could you first describe specifically what new era life offers and what this type of insurance is called? 
and then maybe walk us through the biggest differences between that product and what you know a lot of people call major medical insurance. Yeah, well, if you understand what major medical is, if you want to be called a major medical, you have to abide by all the Affordable Care Act rules. That means you have to cover everything for everybody, no pre-existing conditions, and you have to have all these mandated coverages in there, which is part of the problem, which is driving the cost up. So what we do at New Era is we pay on an indemnity basis, and then we show you that we can pay on, basically, it's, it's to, to make it simple, it's not exactly like this, but to make it pretty simple, we offer plans at one times, two times, or three times Medicare. So let's say that if you're going in for that shoulder surgery and it's 6100 bucks, we're going to give you 12250 for the surgery or two times Medicare if you select a two times Medicare program. If you're going to select a three times program, we're going to give you 18000 When it says you, okay. who are you going to give that to? Meaning the We're going to give that either we're going to pay the provider or give it to you, whichever one you request. But So what's going to happen is now you're going to have 18000 We have a company that will negotiate the bill generally less than two times Medicare. So if, it's, if it ends up being 6000 for Medicare, we have a company that'll get you somewhere in the $12,000 range. So if you're buying a two times Medicare program, you can pretty much be comfortable with, we're going to get you down to about the 12000 where you have very little or no money out of your pocket. Uh, you may even have money back because I, we work out situations like here in Atlanta, for example, we have a hip nation, which they charge about 1.2 to 1.5 Medicare. So if you go in, we just had a guy go in for a uh, a sixty some hundred dollar surgery with them a few weeks ago. We allowed over eight thousand dollars for it. So not only did he get the the surgery paid, since we pay on an indemnity basis, we still had to pay him over eighty, just about nine thousand. It was eighty some hundred bucks, just about nine thousand, even though he only paid sixty some hundred for the surgery. So, so he we gave him that money. He keeps the difference. You know? So it's a different type of health insurance. But when you understand it, it makes a lot of sense, and it also puts control back in the customer's hand, not the insurance company's hand. Uh, our company, which will negotiate rates, is called Caris 360. Not not our company. It's somebody we hire. They're an advocacy, advocacy service. So what they'll do is they'll go out and get you five different prices. It can be your surgeon and four other prices. It may be like this. Let's say Medicare was 10000 and we're giving you 20000 at two times Medicare. You might get prices between seventeen and 23000 If you take the 17000 we'll pay the seventeen and give you 3000 overage. If you take the twenty thousand, we'll pay the full twenty thousand. If you take the twenty three, well, we're going to pay twenty, and you're going to pay three. But we'll negotiate all those rates for you and give you, give you the information so you can make the best choice for you and your family. So, if I understand correctly, basically, uh, it, 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 with indemnity coverage, what you're doing is you're saying, look, there's this menu of services. Let's just call it that, and we'll pay for each of those two times what Medicare pay, Medicare pays for that service, right? So, uh, you know, you can shop it around. We have a partner who will do the shopping for you and give you the prices, but that's what we're going to pay, um, as opposed to major medical which works a little bit differently so is that is that a, yeah. a good representation yeah, major, major medical almost does the same thing i talked to a, a number of the, what's called the self-insurers out there and what they say that they they cover it says 80 percent to five thousand. however it's 80 percent of what they deem to be reasonable and customary and when you talk to them they deem reasonable and customary to be less than two times medicare so when you understand that they're basically paying the same way we just because we don't want to be sucked into the ACA, we have to do ours a little differently. So we we give you a bucket of money that says you're going to understand that uh, the cost of the surgery might be twenty thousand, for example. So we're going to allow you twenty thousand to get it done. If you get it done for eighteen, you get to keep the difference. If it's twenty two, you're going to pay the two. It's a little different, but it's what we had to do to get outside the Affordable Care Act and give the small and just give the small independent business person and that guy in the middle of the pack that just doesn't get any Medicaid credits like a lot of people do. He's paying his full premium, and he just can't afford it. So this allows us to bring his premium back down and, and give him some nice options he can select from. So right now, I mean, there's some great benefits here. It's it's more transparent, right? It's you know, it's two times Medicare, and that information is out there. Uh, you have a, a company you work with that can help you shop shop things around. Um, and you know, I, I, there's another benefit we haven't talked about, which are premiums. So premiums generally lower or substantially lower than a typical. Yeah, our, ba- our basic premium that we're seeing is about fifty percent of what the cost in the Affordable Care Act. Now, we'll add things to our program. Like if somebody's not comfortable with that and says, well, I just want to make sure in case it's three times Medicare or four times Medicare, I have the money, 
I can then wrap a bucket of money around another $125,000 bucket of money to give them extra coverage. Uh, that'll bring the cost up a little bit. I can also, like we're really good at hospital and surgery, and we give them a limited outpatient. So we do cover some outpatient, but not everything. I can add on extra outpatient services. Even if I do all that, I'll be 30% less than the Affordable Care Act, and I'll have no deductible where the average premium on the, the Affordable Care Act is over $6,000 now. Yeah, yeah. So the it's, person's getting a usable program. You're getting something you can actually use for you and your family, not something you're going to pay for then also pay all the bills. Well, it, ours dropped in half. So when we signed up uh, with this particular policy, uh, we were close to 1400 a month, and we're now at about seven hundred. Uh, it was it was significant. Um, I, I'm curious about one of the questions that has come up is uh, who takes this kind of coverage? Who takes this kind of insurance? You know, is is my doctor on on this network? Is there a network? All the options are in your court. Okay, for one, you, you're a lot, a lot of my customers will ask the cust- will ask their doctor, "What's the cash price?" However, we also give you PHCS, which is the largest network in the country. So you'll probably find your doctor on PHCS. So in that case, you just give our card and it, we, you get the pre-negotiated rates. If he's not on PHCS, you just ask him what a cash price is. And he can either file it for you or you can file it yourself. It's, up to, it's, a, it's between you and your doctor then. Uh, some of these, what's called direct primary care, is that's the whole purpose. They're coming in giving you great doctor care services at low premiums, and they're doing that because they don't want to take any insurance. In that case, you can still go to those facilities, and we're going to reimburse you on that case. But like a lot of people don't want to deal with that, and they use PHCS in there, and they just give the card, and we take care of it that way. So we give we give you both options. You can go in a, in a network if you want to, or you can go outside. We're going to pay the same either way. And PHCS is a PPO network, you said, right? Yeah, yes. PHCS is the largest. It's the largest PPO in the country. Uh, many companies like Humana use it in a lot of different areas because they don't have their own doctors in every area. It's used by every hospital in the Atlanta area is on it except for Kaiser. Uh, it's the only, only hospital in the area is not on it. So you're you're automatically going to be getting discounted rates in most places you go in most major cities. So, um, in terms of let, let's talk about ACA, uh, you know the, the 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 penalties have gone up significantly this year, from what I understand, to two point five percent of your adjusted gross income. It used to be when it first came out, you know, not a big deal. Uh, yep. Now you got to make sure that you're compliant, or you're possibly looking at a penalty. And I know there's some controversy about whether the government will actually uh, enforce that, but I'm curious, is this policy or are these policies ACA compliant? We can make them that way. It all depends on what the customer wants. Okay. In order to make a a plan ACA compliant, all we have to do is add what's called the minimal essential coverage, and we have that available. And what minimal essential coverage is, is no more than your physical. But along with that, the program that I have that add, adds on the minimal essential coverage, I can add additional doctor visits. I can add prescription drug service, whatever the customer needs. And even if I put prescription drugs, additional doctor visits, complete outpatient services, I'm still 25 30% less than the Affordable Care Act with no deductible. Gotcha. So these are bolt-on extras depending on what the customer wants. Yeah. Some people say, I don't want all that. I don't use it. I don't need it. I don't want it. Okay, so we say, okay, we scale it down, we give them, and they'll end up being half the price of what they're paying with the ACA. They want everything that's in the ACA pretty much, except for a couple of the mandated coverages we don't, we don't allow anywhere, like the uh, voluntary sex changes and uh, abortions on demand. We don't put either one of those in our program. But pretty much everything else we have in there. Uh, all the other coverages are there. Something happens, you get sick, injured, heart attacks, cancers, whatever happens to you, you have full coverage for it. All right, so I'm going to ask you the big question, Mark. And this is probably the most common question I got. What about pre-existing conditions? That's obviously a big concern. I'm curious, what types of pre-existing conditions would disqualify someone from getting this kind of coverage? Where I have answers for everybody, no matter what their condition are, there are some things that my base program can't take, like a heart attack less than 10 years, cancer less than five years ago. Uh, but, But even with that, I have options for those people. For example, I'll, I'll take a, a family who's maybe paying uh, $2,000 a month, which is pretty common right now, and I can separate the person out who's really sick, keep them on the ACA, reduce the family's coverage probably down to $1,000, including his ACA cost, and then we can use maybe that additional money then to fund the, Ill, the illness, the person with the illness, 
so that they bring their deductible down and have lower out-of-pocket expenses or even have extra cash for the family so they can do other things with it. So, the, And then I have minimal essential coverage and alternate programs, which do pick up those pre-existing conditions also. So I do have options. It's not always perfect, but we have, we have a, a broken system and we have pieces that can, that can fix most things for most people. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, people, when, when I asked the question and this question came up, about uh, pre-existing conditions, nobody was really sharing what they had. But you know, I know pre-existing conditions sounds like such a scary term, but it could be anything from high cholesterol to you know, I get regular ear infections to you know, I had cancer three years ago. Well, right. A standard a standard pre-existing is what you've been treated on in the last twelve months isn't covered for twelve months forward, but it's covered on the thirteenth. So what we have is we have available programs like that minimal essential coverage, which I can add additional doctor visits. I- things. I can add a whole host of stuff to get you through that 12-month period to where you'll be comfortable with it. I can put emergency room visits. I can cover a lot of stuff for most of these minor illnesses, so you don't really have anything that's not going to be covered. Uh, and on the 13th month, the full hospitalization all then opens back up for any illness. But like uh, cholesterol just means that the cholesterol would have had to cause something. So generally, with, on, a, on a person with high cholesterol, the only thing we're not covering is the medication for the first 12 months. Uh, with so most things are, are minimal, what we're not covering. And, and years back, that used to be different. So I've been in health insurance for a lot of years, and it used to exclude your, half your body when something was wrong with it. Nowadays, they just look at the specific related uh, illness. So cholesterol, they're just looking at the high cholesterol. As long as you didn't die of high cholesterol two weeks from now, uh, as long as it's controlled, you have no trouble with most of the pre-existing conditions. No, but that's good to know that there's some options, right? So what I'm hearing is, yes. look, uh, don't assume that just because you've had something that you know you don't qualify. It, the, the answer is it depends, and there's all kinds of different options and creative ways to to get you what you need. Yes, I, I think a I lot of people have given up. That's why I'm saying that. Yeah, if I, I have people come to me all the time that said it's breaking her back. We're paying $2,000 because so-and-so's got this illness, and we just can't afford to do nothing else with the family. And I show them a way to save, put ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 back in their pocket to help afford the other bills or, or maybe give them some relaxed time that they haven't had for a couple of years. So there are plenty of options for most people. So you mentioned prescriptions. Let, let's go there. What about prescription drugs? <laughs> is there coverage, discounts? How is that handled? We, I have everything from on our basic program where we just reimburse a little bit towards your medications till I have a full-fledged prescription drug card if somebody needs it. So it depends on what they want. Again, if they want to pay for it, I have it. So I can give them a, I can give them a, a $1 generics and where they pay 10, 20, 30% off of different higher price medications. They get, they get to pay a small percentage of the total. Uh, but then they'll pay more. So it, it depends. We put it together for each person and, but it, like I said, even if I put together the prescriptions and everything else, I'll have no deductible and be and still quite a bit less than what the Affordable Care Act's doing right now. So yeah, it really depends on what you're on, what you've been on in the past, and and so forth. And there, there's you could you could look to see what would make sense for somebody. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've had a question about natural health practitioners. So, and, and I, I think I know what the answer is, but I just want to ask you. Let's just say, you know, I, I got something going on. I don't want to go see a traditional doctor. I want to see a chiropractor or a natural health homeopathic type uh, practitioner. What would these policies paid for, if anything? Well, in chiropractic care, we still give you six visits per year for chiropractic. So, and we pay more than what they allow. Like our two unit programs, which is two times Medicare, pays $80 a visit. Most chiropractors here in this area are about 60 bucks a visit. So we're going to pay you 480 bucks or six times 80. And well, that's how many visits you can get for us to, to pay for. That's how many visits we'll pay for you for the year. Six, but you're going to get, actually make money each time you go. You'll make about 20 bucks and that might make it seven or eight, seven or eight visits that you get for the year that you didn't have to pay for. Uh, so it's not complete coverage, but it is some coverage for you. Uh, or chiropractic for homeopathics now. If the person's a certified doctor, we're still going to give you an eighty dollars visit charge. But it's all, so it all depends on if, if it's just a nutritionist. Maybe it doesn't actually. It's not actually a doctor. Uh, may not be covered. But as long as they're if they're a doctor and you go in for any type of illness or injury, if it's just because you went to a nutritionist to adjust your diet probably not co- not a covered expense. But if you went there because you've got a deficiency 
which could be considered an illness, then we're going to pay you $80 a visit. So you just can't go there just to have them adjust your diet to make you feel better. Yeah. But if you, ha- if you actually have an illness of some type, then they'll pay the $80 a visit. Gotcha, which is your standard payout for a doctor's visit. A doctor's visit, yep. yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, so you know, we're all self-employed. Uh, one of the one of the big things that we get as self-employed professionals is the ability to deduct uh, the premiums uh, from our, from our taxes. And I know you're a financial advisor, so you can probably you mm-hmm. know you tell me if you feel comfortable answering that. But is is are the premiums tax deductible if you own a business? Yes, they are. Premiums are deductible for all your health insurance premiums now. Now, the other premiums, the things we call minimal essential coverage, they're not actually considered insurance, so you don't actually get the deduction for those. Uh, so, a couple. So, most of our premiums will be deductible, but there's a couple that aren't. So, I go over that with each person also. Gotcha. Okay. The big, the, the biggest part is deductible, though. The dedu- deductible um, for for what? Um, um, for health, as a health, you can do it. You can do it. A small business owner can deduct it as his health insurance premiums, and also, if if it's a business owner and he's got employees, he can do it on a pre-tax basis. Also, oh, got yeah, yeah, okay, makes sense. Okay, um, one of the things that came up is, and, and I was curious about when you and I started talking, is okay, you know, this sounds great. It's you know, pretty much the the option that's best for me and my family. Fifty percent of what we're paying now. But, you know, what am I getting into here in terms of increases? You know, what's been the track record of this company in terms of annual increases? Because I've seen 23% the last two years each year. You know, what have you guys been seeing? Well, if you look back just two or three years ago, we were maybe 20% less than the Affordable Care Act. But their rates are skyrocketing because of the claims experience. We have a better group of people. We have more non workers We have healthier people in general. Uh, we don't have to take the guy who just had a heart attack. So our premiums are staying more stable. Our increases have been 1% or 2%, plus you go up a little bit for your age each year. Uh, I went from 59 to 60 this year. My rate increase was about $25, um, and that's because most of that was for age. So as you get older, it goes up for that, then it goes up a little bit for the price increases. So our price increases have been really stable. Uh, where the ACA is skyrocketing, that's because – healthy people are getting off the program. I mean, only, only the people with major illnesses that think they have nowhere else to turn are staying with them. Yeah. Um, but, but that's good to know. I mean, I, I think, you know, anything in that range is totally reasonable. I just think 23, 25, 30% a year, year after year, it's unsustainable, you know, for, for most families. So um, in terms of, you know, one of the things that I had before this was a high deductible, policy with a health savings account component to it. So I was able to set aside pre-tax dollars to save up for medical expenses and pay my expenses out of that. Uh, or is there an option for something like that, like a health savings account or flex account where I can put aside before tax dollars for to pay for expenses? Well, right now, there's still limitations on the HSA, so we wouldn't be able to qualify. That's some of the things that I'm hearing about uh, in Congress, as well as the president talking about, they're going to make some adjustments in the HSAs to make them more available. And hopefully they'll make them available for all type programs, but that's coming up. Hopefully it's coming up in the next year. But right now, currently we wouldn't, we wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to take ours in order to fund an HSA because you would need a high deductible program to do that. We don't offer that. Okay. Now, since we're not fully ACA compliant, because that's how we build our program with the, with the indemnity basis, uh, it wouldn't qualify for that currently. So I have one last question for you, um, and, and it's hard for me to kind of come up with an actual example. Uh, so I'll just throw a kind of a general hypothetical example out to you. But let's just say there's a situation where there's an emergency, and I wasn't able to shop around, and you know, I just ended up in the hospital, and uh, you know, my bill ended up being I don't know fifty thousand dollars. And let's say that the payout, you know, you guys pay even when it's negotiated. Let's just say that I have a fifteen twenty thousand dollar balance still. Okay, that that's scary to me, right? I because I, I, I'm trying to mm-hmm. insure against those big dollars. Uh, are there options out there where I can just increase the probability that I can cover uh, something like that, where there's a gap that you know you, you, you yeah, between your coverage and what the hospital's billing? That, that shouldn't really happen, but I I blend together with a with a Christian program that will give me what's called a bucket of money. So if somebody really wants that. For an individual, we pay an additional $45, and it 
pretty much works to make it simple. It work as an extra bucket of money of 125,000. So let's say you had a hundred thousand dollar bill and we only paid 80, for example, it was two times Medicare and they weren't budgeting from their hundred. Well, if you put that other $45 on it, that plan would have came back in and paid the entire 20 that was remaining. So we, we do have options for people with concerns like that. too. Yeah. Like the medical cost sharing uh, programs that the Christian ministries have where Yes. You, know, you pay a very month, a low month amount to like, is that where the $45 came from? Is that? That's where that comes from. I don't mind using them for a backup program. My preference would be use, them as, use those programs as a backup because there's, there's no additional funding that they don't have to keep a reserve amount like an insurance carrier does. So I've, I've been in, in health insurance since the late eighties, early nineties. I've seen a lot of companies who have good actuaries who couldn't keep up making their claims payment and either went under or just closed up their doors. So these Christian ministries for many years, they didn't have that many customers. Now they're getting flooded with customers. So they're also going to get flooded with claims. So they have a bucket of money in, bucket of money out. So they pay pay some premiums in, premiums go out. There's no reserve funding for them. So my concern would be in the next few years when they start getting the major claims that you might see some changes in in those programs, pretty pretty hefty increases or some of them going out of business because it just doesn't make sense the way they – they don't really work with a backup system. You know, they don't have anybody like a, a Lloyd's of London reinsuring them or anything backing up that funding. So I'd be a little concerned. So, but to use it as a backup program, I'm real comfortable with that. Yeah, and that's what we ended up doing, right? It's you know, we got the yes. this one, we got the backup. I went with CH Ministries. Um, yep. you know, it's 135 for, for the whole family, but it's strictly the there's family. a backup. Yep. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, if a situation like that ever came up, then, you know, I know I have that as an option. I didn't feel entirely comfortable using that as my main line of defense. Um, although it could be an option for, for people. We're definitely going to talk about that, uh, here in this episode. So, uh, Mark, before we, uh, sign off, uh, so tell us where people can learn about more about you. Where can they contact you? Where can they learn more about New Era? Well, they can, they can come to my website, which is ourplanrocks.com, O-U-R, plan, rocks, all one word, dot com, or they can call me directly at 770-628-5914. I'll be glad to uh, get right back with them with answers on their questions or email and whatever they need to, to find out about their health insurance and do some comparisons for them, and, and I get them what they, what they need, so we can help them out in a lot of different ways. Again, uh, 770-628-5914 or... Uh, ourplanrocks.com. And in terms of new era, if somebody wants to check out that particular company, of course, through you, but uh, where can they learn more about it? They, they can it? also go to newerlife.com. New era Perfect. N- well, N-E-W-E-R-A life. We'll make sure to include all those links and information in the show notes. So, Mark, thanks again for coming on today. This has been very, very helpful. I truly appreciate uh, your insights. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate you having me on today. All right. So my second and final guest is Dale Bellis, who's the executive director of Liberty HealthShare. Dale led the reorganization plan a few years ago that launched Liberty HealthShare under the terms of the Affordable Care Act for healthcare sharing ministries. Now, that organization dates to the mid-1980s, but Mr. Bellis reorganized Liberty HealthShare in 2012 to provide Americans with an alternative to government-mandated health care. This is a gentleman who's been around the industry for many, many years and is extremely knowledgeable, and I wanted to bring him on to talk about this option of medical cost sharing, which is yet another option that many people don't even know exists, and until very recently, I didn't either. So with that, here's my conversation with Dale Bellis. Dale, it's such a pleasure to be talking with you. Thanks for coming on. Ed, it's it's an incredible uh, honor, and I appreciate the invitation. Thanks so much. Excellent. Well, let, let's dive right in, and I think a good place for this would be just a quick intro, quick description of Liberty Health Share, specifically what you guys do, and maybe a quick history on on the company as well. Sure. Uh, we are a nationwide nonprofit association of men, women, and families uh, who, on the basis of our shared values and beliefs gather around a common cause, (laughs) and that is paying each other's medical bills. And we do that by the way of an online secure proprietary software, uh, and uh, we match member to member 
uh, and, and utilizing the principles of mutual aid and mutual uh, assistance, uh, we are sharing about 16 to 18 million dollars a month in terms of members' medical expenses. So we're paying medical expenses without the aid of an insurance company uh, or the government, just a regular systematic way to meet health care costs on a whole different methodology and mindset because we've abandoned the health insurance model and instead use a mutual aid and assistance model. That is that sounds fantastic, I, and I'm curious how, how long has this been around? I, I, how did you guys get formed? Because this is this is kind of a new concept to me as well. Yeah, it it is based upon a tradition that's been alive and well uh, in uh, in Christian churches uh, through the generations, uh, and we've simply utilized that model. Uh, our particular sharing group has been in existence since the mid '90s. Uh, we reformulated and relaunched under the terms of the Affordable Care Act uh, in 2010 through 2012 uh, to make it really available uh, and affordable for all who wish to join in uh, on the basis of our sharing mentality and methodology. Uh, but it, it's really taking the, the principles of Christian assistance uh, and support uh, that have been practiced literally for generations uh, and turned it into a solution for health care. It's, it's this simple, Ed. <laughs> if you really believe that you've been placed here on earth to use your time and resources to assist another person, uh, then we've simply turned that principle and value into a solution for health care. It's that simple. I, I love the concept because I, I we all know somebody who's in need and I think our natural inclination is to see how can we help, you know, and I, it sounds like you, you've taken that principle and systemized it in a way that it's easier to match the need with the benefactor, somebody who can Yeah, we throw help. in technology, uh, we match, and it, and it happens this simply. We ask our members every month to set aside a predetermined share amount. Uh, and they put it into their online account. Uh, we call it a share box. It's a secure uh, account uh, where there it's one ninety nine for a single, two ninety nine for a couple, four forty nine for a family of three or more. We don't count more than three for a family. Uh, that goes into their online uh, secure account, uh, and the share box. Uh, it, then we match that share amount to another member who literally has expenses that month. Uh, and you, on a transparent, open basis, you see your dollars flow from your account to the receiving member's account. You can message them with cheer or encouragement or prayer. And like a true social community, stand with each other during those times of medical expense uh, crises. And then we send a check directly out of that receiving member's account to the doctor's and the hospitals. So every month our dollars are going to another person, not to some company black hole somewhere. Well, let, let's take the concept from the other side of the fence, the person who actually has the need. And and I got a couple of hypothetical situations just so I can kind of visualize how this might work if you're the one with a medical need. Let's just say that you know I have um, something simple from a regular doctor's visit that might cost me $80, $100, uh, to something more significant, let's say that I need knee surgery. So how would each of those two scenarios, how might that work? Sure. Uh, the simple doctor visit and the more complex surgery. In both cases, uh, our, uh, our members, out of convenience, are presented with an ID card. They present that ID card to the doctor or hospital uh, at the counter, uh, and the instructions are given on the card as to where to send the bill. We're all self-pay patients. We're responsible for our care and our costs, we just simply choose to share those expenses in community with one another. Uh, and so the bill is then sent uh, electronically or by mail. We, Liberty Health Share, administratively receives it. We process that bill according to our sharing guidelines. Those are rules or, or, or the guidelines that our members agree upon uh, as to the kinds of bills we're, we'll share in and participate in. Uh, a hospital stay, a doctor visit, uh, et cetera, are all eligible type expenses. Uh, that's processed. 
you see that show up in your individual account online, what the doctor or hospital billed. We make adjustments to those bills based upon a national database as to what is a fair and reasonable and generous, frankly, reimbursement to that doctor or hospital. Uh, we ask a sufficient number of members to participate with that. Just basically crowdfund that particular expense. We send the checks out to the docs and hospitals. That's the cycle uh, every time we have a medical bill. That is pretty remarkable. So something as simple as a hundred dollar doctor's visit to something is uh, more complex, such as a twenty thousand dollar surgery. Uh, it sounds like it works in a similar fashion from traditional insurance. In that, uh, I just show my my card, and then they go ahead and invoice you or send it to you. Is that my hearing? That we are all self pay patients, and uh, we are we have an entire department that are that's every day. Uh, orienting physicians and hospitals uh, to this sharing mentality and the method by which that provider will get paid. Uh, if the provider says, you know what, I'm not going to send my bill directly, I just want to hand it to the patient, uh, that's perfectly fine. We're all self-pay patients. Uh, our members would accept that. Uh, we have a, a way to electronically just take a picture of it, uh, send it to us. We put it in the queue, process it as we would uh, any other bill. Uh, and so whether the doctor presents it to the individual patient on a cash pay basis uh, and awaits the reimbursement, or if the member themselves pay at the counter and get reimbursed personally, uh, either way, uh, it provides the maximum flexibility uh, and convenience to meet those uh, medical bills. Uh, and 97%, this is our experience, Ed, 97% uh, of uh, providers uh, will accept our member's ID card. The other 3% have questions, uh, and we resolve that with them uh, through personal connection and negotiation. Uh, but in all cases, we're there to advocate on behalf of our individual members uh, to both reduce those bills if, it's, if, if there's an excess billing cost or to facilitate that payment on their behalf to the provider. Now, Dale, to be clear, this is not insurance, right? This is not traditional insurance. So there is no such thing as uh, deductibles. There's no such thing as, as premiums. These are, uh, con and, I, and I'm not familiar with the, with the terminology, but I believe these are contributions, as you mentioned, right? So can you maybe clarify some of these things? Because uh, many of us come from an insurance world where we're used to deductibles and so forth. Right. Uh, th there are uh, similarities, but we use a different terminology or lexicon uh, to address those kinds of, uh, of ways in which we share bills together because we're not insurance and we don't, we, we don't do it uh, tongue in cheek, uh, but we do it for the very purpose of communicating accurately to a consumer that they understand we're not insurance. We, we do not operate on the basis of, as insurance does, a contract of indemnity uh, where there are certain promises and guarantees and uh, et cetera, that if I, if I have a particular risk to my health, uh, the insurance company promises to pay that. Uh, and they uh, pool those dollars uh, and pay out of a premium account. Uh, we're totally different. We, we are premised on uh, a mutual value set where we say we, we really are motivated on the basis of what is uh, – key uh, beliefs on our part. Uh, number one, that our uh, bodies are temples and we're going to, uh, to really treat, it, uh, treat our, our physical health uh, in a moral and spiritual way, number one. And number two, that we really are motivated to assist another person whenever they have a bill. Those are the primary uh, basis on which we share. We have what we call shared beliefs. They're on our website and we don't track someone's church attendance or doctrinal beliefs or religious identity. Uh, we just simply say, here are our value set. Uh, if that resonates with you, come join us. Uh, and uh, so consequently, our, our members participate with one another voluntarily, cooperatively, uh, but based upon those values that we are living out every day. Now, how are membership 
contributions kept so low? Because, I mean, you just shared with me earlier in our conversation the millions of dollars that you are, uh, that you're taking care of every month, uh, to people, to members in need. So I'm, I'm curious how you're able to keep uh, those contributions so low and, how much these contributions typically go up from year to year? Because that's an obvious concern uh, over the past sure. couple of years. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, our What we call our suggested share amount has not changed over the past three years. It's been adequate to meet all of the medical bills generated uh, by the members sharing person to person, member to member. Uh, and it's really a three-legged stool. Uh, the first and foremost, uh, is that we are all self-pay patients. They, these dollars come from our pockets and the pockets of our fellow members. It's not a company account or checkbook somewhere. Uh, it is our money. So when I'm standing at the counter, I'm making choices and decisions based upon the cost of my care, uh, uh, looking at the treatment plan, eliminating unnecessary tests uh, and uh, evaluating those kinds of expenses. It's a different mentality. Uh, no longer am I entitled to health care. It's my dollars that I'm spending. Uh, and so that changes uh, the consumer attitude standing at the counter, number one. Uh, number two is we're health conscious uh, members. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of our uh, ethical and religious beliefs is that our bodies or temples, uh, and we're to take care of our health. So we're proscriptive. We're looking uh, to prevent disease, not just simply go to a doctor because we're sick. Uh, and so health conscious people typically have fewer bills, lower costs, recover more quickly from the hospital, uh, et cetera, uh, number two. And number three is few people realize the kind of discounts that exist in the marketplace uh, where what a hospital will bill they will receive far less to settle that particular service. Uh, in fact, the, the billing procedure in, uh, in the medical care world is different from any other economic sector of our nation. Uh, it's, it, and it can be confusing uh, and awkward, but we stand there with our members, assisting them in securing those discounts. And so for all three of those reasons, uh, our cost curve is downward, not upward. So, Dale, what about, this is a big concern for my listeners, what about pre-existing conditions? What types of pre-existing conditions might disqualify someone from becoming a member of Liberty HealthShare? Sure. Uh, health sharing is premised on uh, prospective or future expenses. Uh, and so enrolling with, with uh, Liberty HealthShare, uh, typically you need to take a look at what are the expenses I currently incur uh, in terms of, of medical costs? Uh, our, our initial, the first year, we do not share in uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, but th that's number one. Number two is we really particularly welcome those with chronic conditions. Those are uh, eligible expenses whenever they join us we uh, assign them a health coach, help them set lifestyle choices and decisions that impact those conditions, uh, and we will share in those costs because they are taking very proactive steps toward addressing the costs associated with those conditions. It would be high blood pressure. Uh, all of the ones that I'm going to cite are responsive to lifestyle changes. We, in fact, in the nation today, Ed, have... Uh, an epidemic of chronic conditions. And we're excited to help people change their lives uh, because of these kinds of conditions. High blood pressure, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, certainly obesity, uh, and smoking. Uh, those are conditions that we gladly accept folks, assign them a health coach. They set those uh, goals and objectives, and the health coach simply supports and provides healthy, positive accountability, and life change uh, in order to address those conditions. It costs an additional $80 per month. Uh, so there's both the motivation to change our health uh, and financially uh, a motivation to, once we reach those goals, that $80 drops off. 
uh, and, and I'm glad to tell you I'm one of those, and we call it health track, I'm one of those health track members. I'm a type 2 diabetic. Uh, I have uh, been a part of health track for the last, well, since its inception four years ago, uh, because I love it. I love the opportunity to consult with my health coach, make sure my lifestyle choices and pattern, uh, you know, the way I eat, the way I exercise, reduce stress, sleep right, all of the kinds of changes in my life that, it, uh, th that impact my type 2 diabetic condition. And I love it. Uh, and we see people dropping off the program, hundreds of them a month. We send up digital balloons for them, and the $80 drops off, and they continue on as a member. But that's the most significant way that we address pre-existing conditions. Now, and, and I know that uh, it, I completely agree with you. There, there are many things that we could do lifestyle-wise that are hard to do but would make a drastic difference in the, the quality of our lives and our, and our health. And, and I guess I was thinking more in terms of, you know, situations, let's see, I, I, there's so many of them, but I had cancer four years ago and now I'm in remission, for instance. But tr in a traditional insurance environment, I know that's very, very difficult to get coverage if, you know, if it's not guaranteed. So I'm, I'm curious about situations where it's not a lifestyle choice, but maybe something happened a while back. Um, or I have to take a certain, you know, medication that's expensive. I think a lot of people are in situations like that as well. Maybe not the majority, but certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's a concern for, for folks. I understand. Fair enough. And we have a, a set of guidelines that we follow regarding those preexisting costs. Uh, and uh, an individual would just simply need to evaluate if they're presenting a current set of expenses that may not be eligible for sharing in that first year. They just simply need to evaluate whether it's for them. Uh, in most cases, uh, we, I mean, it, it is a very, very small percentage of individuals uh, who do not enroll regardless uh, of those pre-existing uh, conditions. It's a case-by-case -case matter. They have an entire team uh, that helps people do that evaluation uh, and consideration, and in your case, uh, you know, a, uh, a cancer condition uh, is, uh, you know, if, if it's been within a particular uh, number of years, and it's our look back is three years, uh, but if there are current medications or treatments uh, ongoing, uh, then it's just a matter of evaluating those costs uh, and moving forward if it uh, is suitable uh, for that individual member. Gotcha. So everyone needs to look at their situation individually. I know that uh, many different variables out there. Um, Absolutely. Makes sense. So I'm curious because, you know, this is airing right now uh, it, during the open enrollment uh, period uh, for ACA. And I'm curious how this type of approach fits in with the ACA and open enrollment. Sure. Uh, under the Affordable Care Act, there's an entire section of the law that exempts Healthcare sharing ministries, which we are one, a recognized uh, healthcare sharing ministry, which just simply means we assist each other. Uh, and uh, we are exempt from both the requirements to have insurance uh, as well as exempt from the mandates of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that's really crucial to us in both those regards, uh, in that because we're not insurance, there is a form that we just fill out with our taxes. Uh, I believe it's Form 8365 or some such. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a simple form that just uh, indicates on our IRS uh, app, uh, uh, filing uh, that we're a healthcare sharing ministry member and therefore exempt from uh, the uh, fines for not having insurance, number one. Uh, number two, the mandates that have been so controversial uh, over the uh, passage of the ACA uh, particularly with men and women of conscience and values who do not want to have their money used in ways that violate their closely held beliefs. Uh, we as a membership uh, have just simply said we're not going to uh, use our dollars in that fashion. And so we're a safe harbor, uh, particularly from uh, those kinds of, of mandates that are uh, conscience-busting requirements. Abortion uh, being the most uh, classic or egregious example of that. Uh, and uh, so uh, we've set our own guidelines, follow our own 
uh, conscience uh, requirements and rights uh, and maintain that as a membership. So two things. It's uh, I, I I can be exempt from the the penalty, uh, but if if I enroll because it's it's a it's a it's outside of the ACA uh, requirements. And the other is the open enrollment. I don't have to wait for open enrollment to. No, we're um, not subject to that open enrollment period. We enroll folks uh, twelve months out of the year. Perfect. Uh, and so, while interestingly, the nation is kind of. Uh, uh, been or been oriented towards making uh, their choices uh, during that period of time as to how they're going to pay for health care costs. Uh, and so we see typically a large spike uh, of enrollments during that period of the year. It, it's just simply because it's become the nature of the cycle uh, with making those selections and choices, but we're not subject to the open enrollment period. Makes sense. Now, one last question for you, and I'm not sure if you if you can answer this, but w- because we're self-employed individuals as, as freelancers, uh, one of the few benefits we get when we do have traditional health insurance is that in many cases, those premiums can be tax deductible. Um, do you know if the government considers these contributions to be, um, Liberty Health Share contributions, to be tax deductible? Uh, they are not treated as premiums, uh, and so consequently, uh, and they are not treated as charitable deductions. Uh, just under the IRS regulations, uh, if I'm contributing to another person with the prospect uh, of receiving something in return from that membership, uh, then it disqualifies as a true arm's length charitable deduction. Uh, Many of our members seek out that kind of tax advice uh, from uh, their advisors uh, and simply uh, follow the the pattern that's already been laid out in the tax code uh, regarding costs for their health care arrangement, particularly if they're self-employed. But there is pending legislation, interestingly, in Congress right now that would clarify that point and uh, and, and treat our health care sharing uh, uh, share amounts in the same way in terms of tax deductibility for self-employed individuals so that there's uh, no further doubt uh, as to whether or not that qualifies. Uh, but that's the current status. That would be fantastic. You know, it's, it's hard enough to be up there on your own, uh, but uh, it, that would definitely be something that would, would, would help us, would help us all. Yeah. Uh, and, right. you know, let's, let's face it, the premiums have gotten so out of control that in many cases, even currently without that deduction, um, other options suddenly become a lot more uh, palatable. So, uh, Dale, well, this has been fantastic. I just want to make sure I point folks to the right place. If they want to learn more about Liberty Health Share, where should I send them? Ed, the best place to go is to our website, libertyhealthshare.org, libertyhealthshare.org. There's a place there to receive a free information packet. Uh, we call it our uh, decision guide, uh, and it's delivered electronically to your email uh, or by mail if you prefer. Uh, there is a uh, toll-free number to call to talk to one of our trusted advisors in our contact center to, for someone just to get all their questions answered. Uh, we encourage that. There is, I understand, uh, a education curve for healthcare sharing versus insurance, uh, and uh, it is a mindset change. It's a paradigm shift, uh, and so we just encourage that kind of inquiry and investigation or peruse the pages of the website uh, but libertyhealthshare.org is the best place to go. Wonderful. We'll make sure to include that link in the show notes. And Dale, thank you so much for coming on. This has been wonderful talking with you. Ed, thank you so much for your interest. God bless. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.